as we told you last week on the show, as we as we loosely reported that Jeremy Pruitt was his first option, but was not going to get the job. <laughs> um, he hires Kevin Steele, who is a who is a baseline of some sort, uh, solid mm-hmm. defensive co- solid defensive coordinator. Um, so we'll start there. We'll get to Tommy Reese and what the offense could look like. But just uh, guys, your thoughts on Kevin Steele becoming the defensive coordinator at Alabama? I I don't know for how many times now. It's uh it's a maintenance hire. I mean, it's it's just it's a body, but I, I you know I said this on Split Zone today actually when we were talking about this. It's it's just a matter of diminishing returns at that specific position, in that Alabama fans and SEC fans, even college football fans, look at Alabama and they are always going to expect the Kirby Smart defense of 2012 and 2013, and you know for really further back that first era of the Alabama dynasty under Nick Saban, and that's not possible anymore. Um, if you're looking for evidence as to why, go go back and look at the offense that Alabama ran opposite of those Halcyon Days defense. Uh, the entire league and basically the entire sport of college football in one way or another is running a faster, more aggressive style of offense. And so I tend to think Pete Golding got mistreated by history. I'm not saying he's as good a coordinator as Smart was or even as a veteran like Steele is, although Steele's had some ter- – I mean, Steele's had some terrible moments. I mean, he's had a long career. You guys remember, like, you know, when he was a DC at Clemson and they got embarrassed in the Orange Bowl by Dana Holgerson's West Virginia. It's a hire. You know, ultimately, I think it, it, they might look. Bama fans have yelled about like wanting more fundamentals, whatever that actually means. I think Bama fans are going to have to understand the hard way by the end of this coming season that it, it wasn't a defensive coordinator issue, that the game has changed. And sometimes you're going to give up 37 points in a really good win. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it just came down. I think there's a, just a lot more moving parts at Alabama right now. Well, obviously we see like we see them, but even just in the way that the last season went, as opposed to what they're, they expect and how they expect to play. I feel like Saban's just kind of like trying to get as many, get like regain control. Not that he ever truly lost it or expectations for them are just through the freaking roof but they are familiar with each other. It's a little bit more consistency than, you know, than bringing somebody else in that maybe doesn't, Saban doesn't know as well. And I think a lot of times coaches that do what Nick Saban has done and can create that much consistency, uh, familiarity feels best. Well, and at the end of the Gus Malzahn era, that was their identity was Kevin Steele, not Gus Malzahn, to be fair to him. Um, He's not going to overthrow the government. Um, working for Nick Saban. There's no question he can't do that. Um, I think it's a good fount, like to your point, he's a body. Like I think there's a, a high floor with him and being fourth in the nation in yards per play defense last year for Pete Golding. Like again, as we said at the very end of last week's episode, it wasn't all exclusively uh, performance based with Pete Golding. Um, so I, it'll be interesting to see. I think it is what it is. I think it's fine. A fine hire. It is. It's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm far more interested. Uh, here's my, here's my theory. Uh, this is a two year stop gap until Jeremy Pruitt is allowed to be his defensive coordinator. That that's what it feels like to me, uh, that it's a bridge hire. How, how, how crazy well, am I there? If you say aloud, if you say aloud, then the, the sec is going to disavow <laughs> any knowledge of permission, permissive, uh, structure framework. You're not supposed to be able to do that if you're the SEC, even though I think everybody and their brother knows that the the league intervened on the on the Pruitt move. And it's so that yeah, the non hire ends up being more of the story than the hire. Well, and and again, the guy's about to go through his NCAA investigation. Like this is not like he's he he's still got stuff impend there's still stuff out there that's pending. But as we said on last week's show, it's he was basically the first call and Saban wanted Pruitt, but uh, we'll see what happens with Steele. Offensively, it's far more fascinating. We, we again, we talked about this last week on the show. Ty Simpson seems like he's going to give Alabama more of what Saban wants, which is to go down the field and to attack every blade of grass and do all that stuff. You just mentioned the old school days, Godfrey. It's funny, like if they go with Jalen Milrow, it could be more like that 2016 Jalen Hurts offense that we saw when he was a true freshman. Uh, by the way, Jalen Hurts in the Super Bowl. Isn't that a, a wild story? Um, I, I'm curious, what do we think Tommy Reese, who's the new coordinator from Notre Dame, played there? Has it, we don't really know a whole lot about the players. We don't really know a whole lot about the scheme. What, what do we know about what Tommy Reese and what Alabama's offense could actually look like? Floor is going to be higher, obviously, because it's a personnel-based evaluation of a coordinator. So a lot of people are... It's funny because Notre Dame fans are kind of 
happy angry right now there's this love hate thing that they've had with reese for years and that really dates back to the brian kelly era like when you talk about marcus freeman's time at notre dame it's still an incomplete data set he hasn't had enough time because when he first got hired he said we're going to change the personnel the look of this football team the look in finger quotes of a person of a of a football team is really for a coordinator that's well how, how many athletes do i have what, what's the caliber of talent i have around me and that's going to dictate what i call and what kind of coordinator i'm perceived to be so i think if you're trying to like look at notre dame the last two or three years and then try and comp that to alabama that's a fool's errand i mean skill There's position no, it's yeah. just no comparison so well, Reese gets to open a wider book. Yeah, yeah. So Tommy Tommy Reese is uh, I, I agree with that. Now I will say the one thing you do know is that Michael Mayer was probably the best tight end in all of America last year at Notre Dame, and that he force fed him whoever the quarterback was, whatever the offensive line situation was, however youthful the receivers were and the injuries on the offensive line, all this stuff very well documented with with Notre Dame. He did force feed his best player. And I don't know if it, like I, and he found a creative way to make sure he was getting him the football the entire time. So is that, is that a, right. that, that's to me, like that's one of the only data points. I feel like I can make the case for Tommy Reese to be like, you don't have this list of stuff. He developed this guy. He sure. He sure. out schemed this coach in this situation. Like we just don't have anything. I just, I'm always, I'm always hesitant to comp on analysis between programs, like one coordinators. The reason being like the personnel thing that we've established, but also we don't even know what the philosophy of the, um, what what Freeman's, you know, not hold on him. That sounds more negative than it should be. You know, Freeman may have said force feed, right? We don't know. I, that was a roster that true. was definitely in transition in South Bend. So I think that he, look, anybody, pretty much anybody, unless they're coming from Athens at this point, goes to Tuscaloosa, they get more options as a play caller on either side of the ball. They yeah. get more luxury. They get to play a little bit more. And so I think what you see this fall won't be comparable to to anything that he did in South Bend for obvious reasons.